Upcoming, we have Dave Snowden. Um, Dave Snowden is the founder and chief scientific officer of Cognitive Edge. His work is international in nature and covers government and industry looking at complex issues relating to strategy, organizational decision making, and just pure decision making itself. Um, so let's welcome him um, to the stage to talk about enlightenment to entanglement and how do we make sense of a world of accelerating uncertainties. Okay, so um, what I plan to do is really two separate things. One is probably going to deeply upset a lot of people and I don't apologize for it um, because I'm going to challenge a lot of the basic assumptions behind HR and leadership. Um, and then I'm going to go on and talk about a whole series of sort of practical methods and tools that you can actually use based on what effectively is a new set of scientific facts. So two, two things up front on this. The first is the general name for the approach I'm adopting is called naturalizing sense making. Um, it's now acknowledged as one of the five distinct schools of sense making, which is nice. Um, sense making I define as how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it. And with that comes a concept of sufficiency um, because it also implies how do I know when I know enough and what type of actions can I base on the level of knowledge I've actually got. Yeah. And one of the things we know, and this is the first of my sort of anti-enlightenment type concepts, is the reality is we never have enough information to actually make rational decisions. And as conditions become more and more uncertain, we have less and less information, and therefore the way we have to make decisions changes radically. So that's kind of like one thing, and the, the naturalizing in sense-making comes from the philosophical tradition, which basically says to root what you think in the natural sciences, not in the social sciences. So the whole approach I've adopted over the years is to say, what do we know from natural science about human cognition systems? And that's knowledge which has been validated and checked by lots of different people from many different backgrounds. And then what does from that construct methods and tools which are consistent with that theory? Um, what we don't do as a group is to do the case-based approach to identification of theory, which you see in most management textbooks. Um, so you all know the way this works. Somebody goes and studies 10, 15, 20 companies. Um, they interview leaders. They identify things that these companies do. And they've chosen companies who either have a quality they're looking for. You know, they may have a high HR retention rate. They may be strategically good over a long period of time. Good to great is a good example of this. These companies have been successful for a long period of time. I'm going to research everything they did. And what I'm then going to do, and it's the mathematics is sometimes very elaborate, is I'm going to actually correlate to co I'm going to correlate things that they did you know, with those companies and say, if you do these things, you too will be successful. That's kind of like the basics. If you read virtually any popular management books, here's some cases, all of these cases were successful. They all did this, so do this, you too will be successful. Now, in real science, that's called the confusion of correlation with causation. So the fact that 70% of American companies have CEOs who play golf doesn't mean that you should substitute golf classes for management education, although it probably would be more valid than a lot of MBAs I've seen. Uh, if a country wants to increase the number of Nobel Prizes it wins per year, all it actually needs to do is increase dark chocolate consumption because dark chocolate consumption and Nobel Prizes per head of population directly correlate for the last four decades. And there's more data in that sample than there is in most of the management textbooks you'll read. So you can't impute an ought from an is. You have to kind of like adapt humor a bit here. The fact that these companies have been successful doesn't mean if you do the same thing, you too will be successful. If you look at a book, um, uh, I forgot what it's called now, at least, what's it, I forgot the name of it. Either way, um, somebody went out and studied a whole bunch of companies in Silicon Valley who succeeded, Lean Startup, that's it. Um, and he identified things they did in common, and then that became a series of prescriptions. If you do these things, you too will be successful. Well, we did similar work when I was in IBM with Dorothy Leonard of Harvard, 
And we also studied companies who failed, not just companies who succeeded. And what we found is the companies who failed did exactly the same things as the companies who succeeded. And the problem we had there is that as a market, there are so many players, some are going to succeed. So the fact you just pick the ones that have been successful doesn't mean you've got a causal relationship. Um, I could go on with examples. There's a famous um, error in logic, which is called the Texan sharpshooter, who basically shoots his gun into a wall and then goes and places the targets where his bullets have hit. And you can see a lot of that in management textbooks as well. Now, case-based approaches have learning in them, but context shifts. So let's take good to great as an example. So what he does is he goes and studies a whole body of companies who are successful for a long period of time. Um, he identifies things they did in common. Now, it's all got a bit embarrassing of late because those companies have all largely failed. Yeah, but let's ignore that for the moment. What he fails to realize in the companies he's chosen is that each one of them was what we call an apex predator. They were the first into their field. And if you know anything at all about ecology, you know that the apex predator, the first thing to stabilize in your ecosystem, survives no matter how incompetent they are until the ecosystem is disrupted again. So there's a much simpler explanation for natural science. Yeah. I won't go on about this because the fundamental point I'm trying to make is you can't rely on case-based approaches and what's called inductive logic to give you any accurate prescription about what you should do in the future. In times of high stability, actually, it's not too bad. But when things are highly unstable, you're not getting repetition between past and future states. Therefore, case designing your future strategy on the basis of what has worked for people in the past is probably even more dangerous. So that switch from effectively case-based or inductive approaches to actually a natural science approach is a key sort of principle behind what I'm going to talk about. Um, and what I'm going to do is to run through C3 sciences before I come on to the second major point. So three basic things that we need to be aware of. Yeah. So let's take the first and the most shocking one. If you give radiologists, and radiologists have a high degree of skill and training that they've acquired over several years, if you give them a batch of x-rays and ask them to look for anomalies, and on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. On average, 83% of radiologists won't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. This is called inattentional blindness. We do not see what we do not expect to see. And there's no way you can overcome this, because the way human beings make decisions is they scan about 3 to 4% of the available data, that partial data scan triggers a series of memories, you know, your own memories, things you've heard from other people, things you've been trained on. Um, and some of them are body memories as well, not just mental memories. And what you do is you blend those together. It's called conceptual blending. And the first blended pattern, which appears to work, you apply. So you do a first fit pattern match, not the best fit pattern match. Now, in evolutionary terms, you can see why this happened. If you think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you want to autistically scan all available data, look up a catalog of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and have an identified lion look up best practice case studies on how to avoid being eaten by lions? By that time, the only document of any use to you will be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament which is the only example I found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore written by a purported survivor. So we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan privilege in our most recent experiences. Now, once you realize that, you realize that trying to make leaders more rational you know, or more process or to scan more is actually not going to work. Uh, we don't, no longer really talk about cognitive biases, by the way. They're cognitive heuristics. They have evolutionary utility. So we have to build systems which finds the 17% who saw the gorilla and ask them questions before they talk to the 83%. Yeah. Now, I'm going to show you an example of that as I finish off, but that's actually not too difficult. But you have to take a different approach. And the good news is it, it's actually about whole of workforce engagement, a whole of population engagement, because out there, somebody has seen something, the issue is how do you pay attention to it? 
So that's scientific fact number one. Uh, scientific fact number two, and this is more complex, um, for my many and various sins for the last four years, I've had to read Trump's tweets every morning, which has been a deeply depressing experience. Um, for a project that I've been working on, uh, which fortunately is now over, um, and hopefully I won't have to do it again. But what Trump does is he uses key phrases to trigger what's called a trope in narrative theory. Um, none of us use the concept of a meme because it's kind of linked with Dawkins stuff on genes and no geneticist takes that seriously anymore. The idea there's something, a single story seeking to propagate itself is just wrong. What actually happens is you tell a story, somebody else tells a story, you like their story, so you tell a similar story. And what happens, and that the internet accelerates this very quickly, is you start to effectively get caught up in a whirlpool of similar stories to the ones that you like to hear. This is called an assemblage if you want to go into the losing epistemology, a trope in, in narrative theory or in complexity theory, a strange attractor, a pattern of attraction that you can't escape. And what Trump has been doing for the last four years is to keep triggering that pattern. And to arguing against it rationally doesn't work because the pattern has already evolved to handle the classic liberal response to Trump. So every time you respond in that way, you make it stronger, not weaker. Now, anybody knows this, if you're in an organization and there's a really strong rumor, the rumor becomes all encompassing. People can't escape from the rumor. And the more you protest about it, the more difficult it becomes. Culture is actually such strange attractors. Culture isn't some quality that you can engineer. Culture is the day-to-day -day stories of the water cooler, the school gate, the pub after work. Those are what define how people think. And part of our work is to measure those, to actually measure and map them. Yeah, because it's those fundamental micro-narratives of day-to-day -day existence which determine how people make decisions. And to use another bad biological phrase, they create the affordances within which leaders can act. So you haven't got this wonderful model by which you can create a rational leader, you know, with rational intelligence, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, whatever you want to talk about. And none of those, by the way, have any basis whatsoever in any cognitive neuroscience. They're just an artificial construct of the last decade or so. It doesn't matter what you do with the individual leader, if the affordances don't allow them to change things, change will not be possible. Yeah, so actually mapping that is key. So that's kind of like key science number two. The third science, and this is what's going to lead me on to my major second point, is complex adaptive systems theory. This is, I'm not going to go into the Kinevin framework in detail here because we've just published a book on that, which you can get. Um, there's loads of stuff. There's a cover article on the Harvard Business Review, which is still valid today on complexity and leadership. It's November 07. Yeah? Now, complexity is sometimes known as the science of uncertainty or the science of common sense. And it deals with systems which are deeply entangled. So everything is connected with anything else. And a phrase from Alicia Giraro, a wonderful way to define a complex adaptive system, is she says it's like bramble bushes in a thicket. Now, I may need to do some translation here. So bramble bushes are these thorny growths that you get with beautiful berries on them, you know, like blackberries or whatever. And if you go walking on the coastal paths in the UK in summer, which I do, you don't need to carry sandwiches but you can just pick the blackberries as you walk along. It slows your pace, but they're gorgeous. Um, a thicket is a small type of wood or a dense undergrowth. Now, if you go walking a lot, and it's one of my main hobbies, occasionally you go with companions who like exploring off the beaten track. Uh, I've now got a deep fear of any time Paul says, turn right through the heather because I know what's going to come. And you sort of end up surrounded by nettles and ferns fighting your way through bramble bushes in a thicket. And because I go walking with doctors, you get sarcastic remarks about how I was getting the tourniquet ready for where you came out because the amount of blood coming from your legs, all right? Now, the point about this is you know that there are separate plants, but you can't distinguish them. If you tug on one plant, you don't know what the consequences will be because you don't know all the connections. And this is called an entangled system or a complex adaptive system. And a key thing to understand about a complex system is that it has no causality. 
There's no linear causality. You can't say, if I do this, it will produce that result. But it does, however, have dispositionality, and it has modulators and constraints, which are the things I can manage. So what's critical in understanding a complex adaptive system, and this kind of comes back to where I was coming from, assemblages and also cognition, all of these things hang together, is it's more important to understand the present than to imagine a future. And what we've seen for the last 30 or 40 years, and this comes out of cybernetics, which has completely wrong ontological models and systems dynamics and systems thinking, is approaches which say, let's define where we would like to be and try and close the gap. Now, that's deeply problematic if you're dealing with a complex system because you can't define an ideal future. And the problem is the focus on those objectives means you won't notice novelty on the pathway. So one of the key things we say in a complex adaptive system is you start journeys with a sense of direction. You don't look for specific goals. So I'll just repeat that because it's important. You need to understand the present. You need to understand the affordances offered to you by the landscape which you're in. And you need to start a journey with a sense of direction, but you need to be open to novelty on the pathway. And particularly post-COVID, that's even more critical. And down at a basic level of measurement, I can send you the references for this. Every available scientific study of any validity whatsoever says that when people are working for explicit goals, it destroys intrinsic motivation. There's no evidence to contradict that. Where do we have the most number of explicit goals? Health, social services, education. Where do we most need the number of intrinsic? Yeah, it's kind of like just ask about face. Yeah? The problem is, and we've done work, for example, in the north of England, which has shown that it's the health and safety regulations which are causing mental breakdown in blue light services, not the job. Because the trouble is the measurement systems and the regulations are designed for the center of a normal distribution, i.e. the average conditions, and reality exists in the tails of a Pareto distribution, not the center of a Gaussian distribution. So you get these perverse results. Now, you can do something different. You still need targets. Some of the work we do is called a vector target. A vector target measures direction and speed of travel for energy consumption. And that's actually a valid measurement in a complex system, whereas an outcome-based take KPI isn't. Yeah? That also impacts strategy. I always find it amazing that American companies adopt the planning cycle of Soviet Russia, you know, five-year plans, three-year plans, right? The reality is, to quote Klaus Fitch, and it's a cliche, but it's true, no plan survives the first encounter with reality. Yeah, And the trouble is, you get plans, lock people into achievement of plans because you get rewarded for achieving the targets. So companies build this energy-consuming bureaucracy into the way that they work, which actually prevents them being adaptive in the future. So managing in complexity is a whole new field of studies. Now, let's come on to the second big subject I wanted to pick up on. And that's this switch from enlightenment to entanglement. This is a John C. D. Brown phrase. He quite nicely wrote the, the, um, it's the quote on the front of the Kenevin 21 book. He says, we are moving from enlightenment to entanglement. Now, if you look at it, the majority assumption of the last two or 300 years has been that everybody is a rational actor. If you put the right information in front of the right people at the right time and they have the right competences and the right training, they will make the right decisions. If people are doing the wrong thing, you go and talk to them about how to do the right thing. And I do a fair amount of work in peace and conflict studies. And there's a whole group of people who are absolutely convinced if they just got everybody in a room together and had a conversation with them, they would all come out as reasonable people. And it just doesn't work like that. Yeah? Um, the assumption is we have to train leaders to be rational. Now, then they got a little bit cold and calculating, so we said, seen the, said we needed to train them to have emotional intelligence. Yeah? Now, all of this sort of stuff and the spiritual intelligence on top of that comes from what's called a Cartesian model of consciousness. Um, and when you look what happens with Descartes, Descartes separates the mind from the body. Uh, the reason he did that, by the way, if you look at Midgley, and I think she's right, is it stopped, it gave a space for science because it says the church is responsible for the soul, science is responsible for the body. And if you don't know it, Descartes was scared shitless of the Catholic Church burning him alive 
but he wanted to carry on doing science. So you can see where that came from. But this mind-body dualism pervades the whole of Western thinking. Most coaches work off the idea we have a consciousness and a subconsciousness, which has no basis in science, but it comes from Freud and Jung. And again, it comes from the same sort of principle. So although we may have good practices, we've got poor theory. And if you have poor theory, things don't scale. Now, the reality is actually very different, all right? I've talked about effectively inattentional blindness. I've talked about assemblages. I've talked about complexity theory. Um, but the key thing to understand is that human consciousness is a distributed function of the brain, the body, and its social interactions. So when you pull your hand away from a hot plate, which is an automatic response, the brain fires after the effect. And I say idiots like Dawkins say this means you don't have free will. But that's because they're assuming the brain is the sole source of consciousness. Actually, the body is part of it. The brain is firing to check if the autonomic response was right this time and see if it needs to correct it. Yeah? And most of the time, we respond autonomically. We only respond with what's called novelty receptive capability when the autonomic response doesn't work. So if you want people to think differently, you've got to increase the cognitive load to the point where the old ways of working won't work anymore. Yeah, and, and that's actually key on a lot of these sort of processes. Um, Andy Clark's work has shown that consciousness is extended into things like collective narrative and material engagement theory from archaeology says that actually the tools we use are also part of our consciousness. So effectively, you're, if your brain goes, you're no longer a conscious being, but the brain isn't coterminous with consciousness, it's a distributed function of which the brain is a nexus. Now, once you start to understand that, a lot of things go. So, as I say, most current management science is let's get people together and agree goals, and you know, the goals will be idealistic, and let's actually walk through and close the gap. All right. Nobody bothers to check if the present makes that pathway even viable. It's just we're going to have a vision, guys, all right? Or we're going to have a purpose, or we're going to have an intention, right? Now, all of these are kind of like just don't work. I'm sorry. I mean, they may make people feel good, but they're, they're bad, right? Um, the reality is we need to take a very different approach. Workshops are fundamentally flawed because they bias in favour of the facilitator. There's a massive criticism of participative action research because it actually privileges the culture of the facilitator. And so it doesn't get to the people you need to listen to. Yeah, And, you know, you don't have enough time to scale by just getting people together. Also, people's behavior in a workshop is very different from their behavior once they leave the workshop. You know, to give you my favorite example, when I was working on peace and reconciliation in Ireland in the 70s, uh, there were two kind of like approaches. One was to get everybody together in a workshop and talk about how it was terrible, we had all this violence, and why don't we just hug each other and stop throwing petrol bombs? Uh, if anybody hasn't seen Dairy Girls yet, then episode one of series two satirizes this absolutely brilliantly. Um, you've got a pleasure to go if you go on that. Um, we took a different approach because actually that didn't work. Within weeks, people were throwing bombs at each other again. We took two Catholics and one Protestant or two Protestants and one Catholic and dumped them into Latin America for six months and didn't talk about the troubles. And actually, cultural change comes from doing things together in a different context, not from talking about it with a counsellor. One of the other major problems we've got at the moment is that a lot of management techniques come sideways from therapy. Yeah, adult maturity models and so on. And all of those assume that people need a therapist and are in need of therapy. And that privileges the role of the therapist. Yeah, you can't translate from individual trauma to collective action, and people have a lot more autonomy. So let's talk about some of the different things we can do, and I'm just going to give you a hint of some of these. Yeah? One of the big things that we focused on now for 20 years, and now we're building as a sort of resilient system for mental health, if you don't know it, we're going to have a mental health plague hitting next month, which will be bigger than COVID in some ways. Um, we know COVID is going to carry on for longer than people think. Uh, we've got sort of naive hope around vaccines, which people just don't understand. This is a flu vaccine type, you know, it's not going to work for everybody, yeah, and so on. Um, we can all, already see increasing signs of young male suicide, which is actually an early indicator of something more broadly in society. 
So we're, we're actually using this technique to increase independency between people at a grassroots level and to entangle that interdependency with the formal, formal roles within society because the health service won't be able to cope with the volume of people coming into it. Yeah, so actually they'll be neglected. Now this works on a basis what is called trios. So I'll give you my example from software design. Uh, once you get the point about inattentional blindness, you realize that there's absolutely no point in sending out a systems analyst to interview people because they'll only hear what they want to hear. So we take a young, bright programmer, a senior person responsible for design, and a user trained to talk to IT people, and it's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than the other way around. Um, and that's called a trio. And they go out together and they work together and they come up with an idea and some prototype. But we don't deploy one, we deploy 15 or 20 because we need parallel diversity to see what's possible. And then what comes out of that gets sorted, selected, and put into a more traditional software design process. In terms of resilience in society at the moment, we're putting teacher with parent with pupil or, or child, and we're creating multiple trios like that, but then teacher with social worker with health worker, health worker with police officer, so what we're doing is we're linking and connecting roles in interthreaded patterns so that we increase the informal network. And what we're doing is building a dense network by which ideas and needs can flow very quickly. And the roles are called a point of coherence. So this is my entanglement concept, right? The roles link into the formal system so they can trigger the formal system when it's needed. So we break the sort of linear process. Yeah? In organizations, this is very powerful. New joiner with employee about to retire with a middle manager on leadership course. 15 of those trials will be very innovative. Oh, and by the way, if you want innovation, you want under 25 and over 45, between teenagers age brackets, people aren't open to novelty. Um, the evolutionary reason for very simple, you don't see racism in kids until after puberty. After puberty, you have to lock down to conform with the needs of the hunter-gatherer community of which you're a part. So by early 20s, yeah, you're blind to novelty. And then chemically triggered male and female alike, late 40s, you become the brain becomes plastic again. Because if you survive that long in a hunter-gatherer tribe, you've got something about you, but you shouldn't be leading the tribe because you're not fit enough. So you go into child care and wisdom management. Yeah? It's interesting, if you look in the humanities, Innovation is in people in later life, in the sciences, it's earlier life. So what we do is we couple the two together. We're doing the same in society. We're putting young person with grandparents, if they come up with a novel idea, they're put into a trio with somebody in government who can make the idea work. And again, it's this distributed micro intervention um, in terms of the overall patterns of what we're trying to achieve. So building an informal organization which the informal organization is there anyway. Yeah. Um, if you have actually trigger and build it, then you can use it. And you know, when I was working in IBM, the ratio between formal and informal communities was one to 64. And the energy costs are the 64 because informal networks are not subject to the second law of thermodynamics because they're open systems. Whereas formal systems require a lot of energy. Yeah. So that get, creates an increasing level of resilience. So that's another example. The final example, and I'll sort of finish off with this because I'm coming up to about 10 minutes for questions, which is the plan. So I'll just show a picture from a recent project. Right, this is a cultural change project. And what we've done here is we've kind of like created a description of the current situation and the executive's vision of kind of like the direction of travel they want. And that's been created as an infographic. You know, so the, you know, the, the sort of thing people see, like a Facebook news page or something like that. That's been distributed to the entire workforce who interpret it into a quantitative structure in real time. This is using wisdom of crowds. Uh, if you may not know the case, but a US submarine grounds off the coast of Portugal in the 1970s. Nobody knew where it was, so they gave partial data to groups of experts around the world, including Nova Scotia fishermen, 
None of the experts got it right, but a probability distribution of all the experts was within 600 meters of the submarine. Now there's sound statistical and cognitive science reasons for why that works. So what we've done is we've got the whole of the workforce to interpret a vision common statement assessment in real time. And then from that, we draw the map. So you know, let's take the colors. I've got green, purple, orange, and blue. So those might be age groups, or they might be divisions, or they might be sales against production. You, know, you can play around with this as much as you want. And these are everybody has been given the same data and everybody has been given the same interpretive set, but look how different they are. So there's a lot of overlap between purple and yellow. In fact, purple is a bridge group between orange and green. Blue is an outlier. Now that may be mean that they've seen a gorilla and everybody else is ignoring them. So you need to go and talk with them. But it also may be they've got to be brought in. Now, in terms of cultural change, yeah, it's stories that count. So for every, anywhere I click on this screen, I can read the stories which produce that pattern. So I've got the objectivity of numbers with the persuasive power of narrative. Now, in this case, let's assume that the executives have decided the omega point is the more desirable state. That's kind of like where they'd like to be. Now, notice they're working out where they want to be based on what is not some fictional state. So if we could all get to point omega, life would be better. But the alpha guys are far too far away from omega, you can't make that in one jump. So you move through stepping stones. So beta is what is called an adjacent possible. So I click on the beta point there and I read the stories and I say to my employees, how can we create more stories like these? And I click on the alpha point and read the stories and say fewer stories like those. And that can engage virtually anybody. More stories like this, fewer stories like those. And once I've got beta there, I move to gamma, then I move to omega. And that actually also gives me a vector measure. Now that technique can be used for a lot of other things. And I needed to show you one visual to get the point. But what I'm critically doing is I'm mapping the present and determining what pathways are possible. So I'm managing the evolutionary potential of the present rather than dealing with an idealized future state. So just taking a natural science approach to this, stop the vision statement, stop the purpose statement, stop the visionary goal, stop the attempt to get leaders to be perfect leaders, and start to actually look at the context in which people are work and manage that context. Recognize that informal networks are more powerful than formal systems, and leaders are only as good as the ecosystem within which they work. And that's left 10 minutes for questions, so I've managed the time in there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, so for those of you listening, um, we have the chat, so please uh, write your questions there. I'm happy to read them um, and get Dave to kind of answer them for you, I guess. Um, because there's a little bit of delay, I just wanted to, what would be the, the key kind of, or any any advice for trying to change that right trying trying to move away from very goal focused and to something more i think i mean in, i mean you, you've got to be logical to your own principle if you say you've got to start with where things are where things are are people that are obsessed with goals um one of the ways we found it successful is to say okay so where where is there strong entanglement where there are lots of interactions maybe you should look at a vector goal there, not an outcome-based goal. Right? Or wouldn't it be nice if you could get the whole of your workforce to tell you what was going on and help you make decisions? So if I'm under conditions of extreme uncertainty and one heuristic to understand what a complex adaptive system is, is if the evidence supports competing hypotheses and you can't resolve which one is right on the basis of the evidence within the time frame for decision-making, it's complex. So I ask executives, you ever been there? And you get loads of examples. You say, well, what we could do is we could put the problem to the whole workforce and we could show you one of these maps. And where you've got density, that means there's consensus around that, but these are outliers, so maybe you should talk with them. And this is actually called abductive logic, not inductive logic. Yeah? So that's what you do. You're very pragmatic. We can get the whole of your workforce. We can give you real-time decision support capability. 
We're doing some of this on campuses in the US at the moment, using students as ethnographers. And they want to do it because they want to get weak signal detection of abuse, which is a common problem on campuses. But also, if they have a shooting, they need to have a sensor network in place to give an immediate response. Yeah, but you can't afford to wait for traditional approaches. So I call it dealing with intractable problems. Yeah, you find those and you work with them. So we have a question from Ava. Uh, for those of us who work with agile teams and complex problems, what advice would you give to facilitate better and help them make better decisions together? I think there's several things. Um, first of all, the key thing on Agile is to adopt a multi-methods approach, not a single method approach. And the, one of the problems with Agile at the moment is you get these wars, right? You know, we're, we're Scrum, we're Kanban, and God help you if you're safe, right? Um, which is the antithesis of agility. So kind of like, first thing is, you know, a work person is only as good as, if generally likes to use their own tools. We don't all drive to work in the same color car. Yeah. So you need to allow a degree of what's called requisite diversity. Secondly, start to look at what I call pre-scrum. Most agile programs go wrong because they're partly based on a manufacturing metaphor. What they want is for somebody to tell us what we've got to do and we'll measure you on what we produce. Yeah. Now that doesn't add any value to the business. What IT should be doing because users don't know what to ask for because IT is progressing too quickly. So one of the things we do, for example, is we map unarticulated needs and match them against existing capability. So if you're an agile team, I would focus on how you get the requirements into the system because that's where things go wrong. And I'd also focus on realizing that self-management or self-organization, dependent on which version of the Scrum Guide you happen to be reading, right? Um, actually requires what are called enabling constraints. It's not just anybody who turns up. So if you look at what I'm doing with trios, which is an extension of pair programming, mm -hmm. we're forcing variety into the interactions, but allowing people, if the variety is present, to make decisions without further reference. So if you've got a trio with these three th roles in it, you can make a decision. If it's just you, sorry, you can't. Right? So that, that's kind of like, well, those would be a couple of things. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of people asking, where can they get more information? Is there any book recommendations? Where can they dig deeper in all these topics? Um, okay, well, the Kinevin book isn't out yet because I haven't written it, right? Um, but my colleagues got fed up. It's the 21st anniversary of Kinevin this October. So they produced a book and they conned me into writing a 13,000 history of Kinevin article. So that's out and that's on Amazon and that gives you a good idea of a lot of this stuff. Um, our website is there. I do most of my thinking on the blog. Um, and actually a couple of days ago, I wrote a retrospective on the last year, which summarizes all the blogs. So if you have a look at that and link through, there's a, there's a major one in there on this enlightenment to entanglement and shifting away from thinking about individuals to thinking about collectives. Yeah. So the, the blog is my medium, that's where I speak. Nice, nice. And yeah, actually a lot of people looking into this. So I guess head, head down to your blog and yeah, kind of read that retrospective and, and get inspired from there. Um, so I, I will give a, a little bit of mo more moments to see if there's anybody else with more questions. Um, in the meantime, um, is there any kind of, right, COVID just kind of introduced a lot of new variables for us. Is there anything really that kind of captured you um, during this time? Yeah, and I think and we're doing a lot of work on this and some of the projections on the states are quite scary at the moment. Uh, the number of people who may just be outside hospitals unable to get in um, is a really scary figure, right? So um, I think a couple of things. First of all, don't believe the hype that we can go virtual because we can't completely. Uh, we know, for example, a lot of human trust decisions are made based on pheromones. Um, so if you get people down to just visual and oral stimulation, you put them under huge stress yeah, because they're not getting the signals they expect. So it's kind of like we need to think about the mixture of the two. So start thinking about that now. I've just finished writing the European Union handbook on how to manage in crisis and complexity, which will be published shortly. So that's got a lot in it. 
and that will be free, right? The, the great irony is the English have taken us out of Europe, but we're blaming the English for everything, but we always do that in Wales anyway. Um, the other thing is you're in what's called an apex predator moment, right? So the entire industrial and governmental ecosystem is disrupted. So whoever were the dominant predators before ain't going to survive. When the meteor wipes out the dinosaurs, it's not the crocodile or the shark of the next dominant species, it's the first mammal because it's small and energy efficient. So there is a huge opportunity for reinvention, but reinvention means actually creating something new, not copying the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, um, thank you so much. Uh, Dave, we'll, we'll be sending you a, a little bit of keepsake here. I see oh, you have cool. a lot of mugs Another in the mug. background. So one more there for your collection. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, from Stretch. Um, thanks. This is Agile Camp, so I just added it to the group. Yeah. Ah, nice, nice. <laughs> um, so we do have a, a one more question, if you don't mind answering one more. Yeah, go. Yeah, okay. Uh, when it comes to topic of journey over goals, what would be or should be the direction producer? How would you start if not having a goal or idea and achieve or theme or so? Okay, so let me, I mean, I tend to use climbing metaphors because I like climbing, right? So in England, one of the things we do a lot of in Wales as well is horseshoe walks. So you climb up a hill and you walk around a horseshoe, an ex-glacial coom, and you come down the other side. Once you've done the initial climbing, walking all the way around isn't too hard. If you wanted to go start to end point by the shortest route, you'd have to go down steeply, cross some nasty stuff and some rivers and climb up steeply. There's more energy involved in that. So sometimes the right pathway isn't the direct, direct passage. Yeah? The other thing is that if I start a journey and I say, well, look, I know I need to get to there and I might think about going to there. If you hold that open, when you get there, you may discover there's another direction which is better. Yeah? So, and that's what we do with the maps I showed you earlier. You, you, you need to map what's possible. Even, yeah. even if you're doing imaginary futures, for example, we do this to get the whole of the workforce involved in creating micro scenarios in real time. Then we map those scenarios and that tells what future states are viable for your workforce so you move to the next one you think makes sense, and then you look again and move again. So effectively, it's stepping stones yeah, is, is the key principle. Well, uh, thanks again uh, for joining, Dave.